Uh, welcome, and uh, my name is Greg Marquis. I like to, uh, to uh, well, I'll just, I'll tell you about myself. I'm a history professor uh, at UMB St. John. It's a branch of uh, University of New Brunswick in St. John. And uh, although I think someone told me lately that the, the strike-bound Chronicle Herald called me a law professor, so I'm not sure if that's a good or bad thing, but anyway, I'm not a law professor. I'll talk a bit more about that later. So thanks for, uh, I want to thank the, uh, the Dean's Office for, uh, for arranging this and uh, also the publisher, uh, my publisher, Nimbus, particularly Jeff Arbo, who's the publicist. I think Jeff's at another event tonight. As you may know, there's a lot of books being released and launched just before Santa. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, I don't know, I was talking with my friend John McKinnon, who's here earlier. Uh, I don't know if people remember April Wine back in the day, but I think Miles Goodwin, the lead singer <laughs> from April Wine, is launching a book tonight and he's playing guitar too. So <laughs> I wish I was at that one. But anyway, uh, I can't be. So anyway, but I can go home and li listen to my April Wine records when I go back to New Brunswick. So uh, I'd li like to thank you folks for coming tonight as well. It's a, you know, a historic night uh, with what's happening uh, south of the border. And I know we won't find out the details until the wee hours, but I'm sure whatever happens will go down in history either way, and uh, hopefully it won't be overly dramatic. Uh, now, I, I've attended events at this law school over the years. I, when I was here, I lived in Halifax when I used to teach uh, part-time at uh, St. Mary's and Dow History, and I, I, many hours I spent uh, uh, in the law library here because I do legal history, right? So, and I attended a conference or two here. I remember people like Phil Girard, and other people. Uh, and uh, I also spent a lot of time in the general area at the Nova Scotia Archives and the Te Killam Library. So I used to live in Halifax, so it's great, it's great to be back. Also, in a way, it's a little bit liberating in a way to get out of New Brunswick to talk about this case because <laughs> in some ways it is, in some ways it isn't. Because I, I find myself with uh, often people with very strong feelings who have connections to the case. But even here, people have a lot of connections to the case. I found when I was here doing some media three weeks ago, every second person I met you know, had a connection to the families or to the case in some way. So uh, I'm a little afraid to ask, so I won't. But, uh, uh, and I'm assuming some of you are legal people and some of you are from the public. I just, uh, I'll talk about my, my legal training or lack thereof. Uh, but, so what I'm going to do tonight is talk about, uh, about a dozen reasons why, why the Olin case matters. And my comments are based on my coverage of the trial, as w the trial in 2015, as well as the post-trial matters, specifically the bail hearings, the two unsuccessful bail hearings at the Court of Appeal in New Brunswick in, uh, in 2016, as well as the recent successful uh, appearance before the New Brunswick Court of Appeal uh, ac for the actual appeal, right, uh, in October 2016, as well as the October 31 sitting of the Supreme Court of Canada. I was privileged to be able to attend that, and uh, again, uh, when I sat down in the, the law courts in St. John back in 2014 to start sitting in on the preliminary inquiry uh, about three years after the murder, I never dreamt that I'd be going to Ottawa to actually watch the Supreme Court of Canada. And you can watch the proceedings online, live stream, but it's really a beautiful building, and uh, I was sort of struck as an historian with what historians often refer to as the majesty of the law when you go into that building. And just to see uh, Chief Justice McLaughlin and, and, and Rosie Abella and the other Chief Justices just speaking in that courtroom, it's kind of neat. Anyway, so my plan for tonight is to give you a somewhat truncated presentation. I was told you could, I could speak for 60 minutes or 75 minutes. You never tell an historian that. You never, <laughs> you never, you never tell. So I'm going to try to keep it shorter because people often have a lot of questions and comments. And even if you don't want to do it in front of the group, often people want to talk after for a little bit. There's also books for sale out in the lobby. And uh, I'm told they're very, very popular with Santa this season. So, uh, uh, so uh, OK, so why a little shorter? I don't overwhelm you with the detail. I want to leave some time for questions. And uh, also, uh, if I give you too much information, you won't buy the book, right? So I'm going to tell you everything that's in the book. So uh, by way of a disclaimer, I need to remind you, I am an historian. I'm not a law professor or a lawyer. Uh, I have been involved with Canadian legal history for probably 30 years or more. But that's my perspective, right? So I can't do instant legal analysis, and uh, as my lawyer friends keep uh, reminding me. 
So uh, if you have questions, uh, legal questions after, I might not be able to answer them to your, uh, uh, to what you want, and I might not always use the right terms and things like that, right? So anyway, that situation about having, you know, a historian speaking in a law school kind of reminds me of a story from uh, uh, Canadian history uh, back in the day. John A. Macdonald used to have to go to a lot of political meetings, and back in the, the Confederation era, they were very rowdy. They could, you know, end with a riot or a fist fight. So... John A. Macdonald, and the other thing too, they weren't always speaking in front of the party faithful. It, there were these mixed party uh, meetings, right? So, so John A. Macdonald always made sure he, he knew where the back door was. And I see that there's a side door there and one there. And uh, had the horse and buggy waiting outside, right? So anyway, so uh, first, before I talk about the significance of this, I want to talk about two reasons why the case is not significant, right? And the first thing I'm going to say might sound a bit harsh because after all, a man was brutally murdered in his office in a quiet street in St. John in 2011. This is just another murder, right? So that seems kind of anticlimactic for me to come all this way having written this book and you've come out tonight and I'm telling you, this is just another murder so we can go home now. That's not what I mean, but it's just another murder. And, uh, I think it's important to think about other victims, other victims of violence in, in St. John and other cities uh, and, you know, whose court cases are not the subject of books or TV documentaries. And uh, so you know, I was struck by this because I, you know, I do talk about some other cases in the book and the, the different community reaction. I'll come back to this on a number of other, issues, other, other points later in the talk. But uh, you know, there are many, uh, in 2011, there were other cases of murder, homicide in, in New Brunswick. There were almost 600 in Canada. Right? And so I think we need to acknowledge these other, and often they're less wealthy, less well-known victims uh, of homicide. They don't have books written about them. And even the accused, you know, I think it's, it's often easy to say, well, the accused, it's, you know, someone murdered someone that's pretty bad. Isn't that the worst thing you can do? Right? And that's true. But if you often look at this, uh, look at these, uh, these people, uh, uh, we don't contone their violence, but it's possible to see many perpetrators Maybe not as victims, as people who are in a bad way. You know, they've been brought up uh, with physical and sexual abuse, drug and alcohol abuse, uh, mental health challenges, uh, personality, so personality disorders, fetal alcohol. Uh, and if you have any, you know, the, the thing that I've learned, uh, uh, not just studying academic literature, but uh, if you have any, you know, this issue of damaged people in the justice system, uh, if you have any doubt about this, because it seems to fly in the face of the common sense attitude of the public. Just go to any provincial court in Canada and spend a day there, right? And you'll soon see that common sense explanations of why people are in trouble with the law don't make any sense, right? So that's a little bit of editorializing. But anyway, uh, in terms of victimization, what was odd about the case, Richard Olin was wealthy and older. And he, you know, so that usually the people in that sort of situation are not victims of violence. Uh, a 2014 StatsCan report on violent victimization indicates that risk increases with poverty, with drug and alcohol abuse by the victims, with mental health issues for victims. Uh, the age, if you're 20 to 24, you're more likely to be murdered, right, than, than any other age bracket. Uh, nighttime activities, if you're out at night, right, uh, if you're living, living or hanging out in a low-income neighborhood, uh, the incident, you know, have you been mistreated as a child, right? Uh, and also your sexuality. Homosexual and bisexual people are more likely statistically to be assaulted and murdered than 69-year-old millionaires who are rece receiving the Order of Canada, right? So again, and that, these are some of the reasons why the case is not typical. We'll get into this uh, a bit more uh, and again, uh, now, so that's the, you know, the other reason why the case is, quote, just another homicide. Legally, it was not a complex case, right? And I know I'm not making this up because this is what the judge said, the trial judge. This is what the Crown said, and this is what the defense said. Legally, it was not a complex case. It turned on one issue, the identity of the person who murdered Richard Olin, right? That's it. That's it. It's not a complex case. Now, it's, but it's, it's a tricky case because of circumstantial evidence. We'll come back to that. Now, the question is, okay, why second-degree murder? And in my book, I look at that in the final chapter. If you see the book, you'll see that the final chapter is like the so what chapter, which talks about the issues back and forth. 
And, uh, you know, was there some planning? Well, maybe, but they couldn't really come up with a, uh, any evidence of planning. So if there's no planning, it's second degree murder. Why not manslaughter? Well, all parties agreed that the violence inflicted on the victim's head, the head injuries is what killed the gentleman, 39 to 40 blows with some sort of weapon, uh, was carried out with such extreme force that there was intention to kill. So the interesting thing for me as well as a non-legally trained person is that there didn't have to be a motive legally, right? Lo lo motive is irrelevant legally. Intent, was there intent to kill? That's the question. Now, motive is part of the Crown's theory of constructing a story for the jury, but that was something I learned as well, that motive is not really, it doesn't matter why he was killed legally, right? But in terms of evidence that's circumstantial that can help maybe the Crown sh sh portray a certain story for the jury, then you know, a, a motive can be useful. Okay, so uh, the first reason why it's significant, I've already touched upon, the prominence of the victim and of the accused. Uh, not to mention the father-son relationship, right? Uh, but so, you know, uh, there were other manslaughter and murder cases in St. John in 2011 onwards, and only one other case was a victim or a perpetrator, arguably of the middle class. And that was a case of intimate partner violence, where there was strong evidence of planning, where, where a, 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 a husband killed his estranged wife, and the charge of first-degree murder was laid, uh, the, the gentleman uh, confessed to, pleaded guilty to second degree murder. It was sentenced to 20 years before parole eligibility. The atypical background of the confessed murderer, whose name was Jason Getson, was commented on by the judge as being not typical at the sentencing hearing, right? He pointed out, you know, you have a job, you drive a BMW, you own a house. We don't get people like you in court on murder charges, right? So again, that's a middle class person. The Olins, here's Richard on your, on your left, and Dennis, his son on the right, uh, were from a different class, right, uh, above the middle class. So back to, the, back to the Richard Olin, the victim was a member of a family associated with the, with the maritime brewing sector since 1867, whose brewing activities uh, in New Brunswick stretched back to World War I. Uh, he was not directly involved with Moosehead Breweries uh, since about the early 1980s, but he benefited from his family connection. He inherited shares in the company from his father, P.W. Phil Olin. And uh, later, uh, his shares were bought out by his brother, Derek Olin, who, who's uncle of the accused, Dennis. He enjoyed life. He was a, a, an avid, uh, there is a moosehead plant on the west side of St. John, uh, the, the biggest independent brewery in Canada, still. Uh, <laughs> So uh, Richard was, uh, enjoyed life. He was an avid skier, fisherman, a sailor. In recent years, he had taken up the competitive sport of blue water sailing, winning international competitions with his high-tech and expensive yacht, Vela Veloce, which is there on the right. And that, that yacht was up for sale and he, at the time of his death, and he was having a new yacht built in Spain right at the time of his death. He was worth about 35 or $36 million when he, when he died. He was a recipient of the Order of Canada, recognized as a high-profile, high-level fundraiser and community leader activist. He had been successful with the Canada Games in St. John in 1985. Uh, he had been chair of the board of the New Brunswick Museum. He was involved with the Roman Catholic Church and other activities in the community. The reputation, he was kind of a gruff, bluff character, but if you needed to raise a lot of money for a project, Richard Olin was the guy uh, that you went to, and he usually got it done. Now, the Olins are not the Irvings or the McCains. That's the, that's the victim's house in Almond Lane. And yes, there is a connection with the Halifax Almonds. Uh, the Olins are not the Irvings or the McCains, but they're not the average St. John or Rosse family. Rosse is the town outside of St. John where the Olins and a lot of their friends lived, uh, live. And uh, the, uh, uh, where are we going here? So Rosse is a separate town east of St. John. Uh, sorry, and, and sort of the, the, the social uh, prominence of the family was evident at the victim's funeral, which I discuss in the book. And uh, again, like the, like, the vic like the funeral of his father, P.W., before him, it was kind of a gathering of the elite. Anyway, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, Rasse, it's a little bit unfair, but it has kind of a reputation for wealth, uh, social privilege, and exclusivity. Uh, 
you know, maybe like kind of a south end of Halifax, you know, it's kind of a bit of a stereotype, but there's some truth to it, and, 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 but it's also changed a lot. It's, it, you know, it's not the Rasse of now, it's not the Rasse of the 1950s or 60s. Uh, so the Bolins are well-connected in business, political, nonprofit, and charity worlds. This class dimension helps explain, uh, I think, the unwillingness of well-known citizens to speak to the media once the crime takes place. It's an issue I explore in the book. The accused, Dennis, personally was not as, as well off as his father. In fact, his uncertain financial situation in 2011, the day after the murder, the day the body is discovered, right, uh, his, his financial situation attracts the police investigators. Uh, this feeds the Crown's theory of motive. So he lived in this nice house in Rossi, which was his grandfather's house that his father helped him secure when, he, uh, when Dennis was divorced from his first wife. Uh, prior to this, prior to the crime, he had traveled abroad with his new wife. Uh, he would continue to travel uh, prior to being arrested in 2013. Right, he's arrested in November 2013. The murder is July 2011. He acquired a new uh, cabin cruiser, uh, used but a new cabin cruiser, to sail on the river uh, after the murder. And he and his wife bought uh, a, a building in St. John a few months after. Uh, Richard's death from where his wife Lisa launched a high-end uh, used clothing store. Dennis was a, an investment broker. One of his clients was his father. So he sort of, you know, much like, much like uh, Richard sort of benefited a bit from his father, uh, Dennis benefited a, a bit from, you know, it's human nature, right, and family connections from, from, from his father. Uh, the main uh, source of support was uh, Richard loaned Dennis in excess of $500,000 in order to settle his, his divorce from his first wife and secure the ancestral home on Gondola Point Road in Rasse. This is a picture of the home, which became another factor. Uh, this, this loan, or whatever you want to call it, uh, became a factor in the police investigation. The accused, who had three children plus a stepson from his second wife, owed interest payments to his father as well as support payments to his ex-wife. From an academic perspective, uh, I view the Owen case as a rare opportunity, rare opportunity to shine a spotlight on a rarely examined sector uh, of New, Brunswick, New Brunswick's reality, the place of elite families and their networks. Uh, secondly, the second reason why the case is uh, interesting matters, unprecedented me uh, media coverage. In terms of media coverage, this is probably the biggest case uh, in New Brunswick since the Alan Legere case of the late 1980s, early 90s. And you might remember that unfortunate uh, series of events, the monster of the Miramichi, who was a convicted murderer, who escaped. And when he was out on, his, uh, out on the lam, he killed four more people, right? So uh, that received huge publicity at the time. It's no secret that crime, especially murder, sells newspapers, although in newspa in new uh, newspapers in New Brunswick don't have to worry about any competition. Right, so <laughs> I guess that's not a really good example, uh, but uh, uh, let's pretend it is. That pre let's pretend it works, though. Uh, so uh, I'll give you an example from history. In 1897, William Randolph Hearst exploited the public's fascination with true crime, following the murder in Manhattan of William, excuse me, Guldensoup, a masseur, whose body parts were found scattered in three New York neighborhoods. The head was never found. Hearst offered a $1,000 reward and formed a team of gun-toting reporters known as the Murder Squad to promote his newly launched New York Evening Journal. The stunt was part of a newspaper war with Joseph Pulitzer's New York World. Reporters from the world sort of won the war because they stole crime scene evidence, a bloody floorboard from the crime scene, and employed divers to search the East River for the victim's head. So this was the launch of so-called yellow journalism, which pushed crime, accidents, comics, and celebrity news. Does that sound familiar? Uh, so this, these are the good old days, supposedly, when journalism was professional. Uh, and there's a famous quote from Hearst, the public likes en entertainment better than it likes information. And he was conscious of using crime reporting as entertainment. And I think that is a large part of what was happening with the, Olin, the coverage of the Olin case. Right? It's entertainment. Uh, and again, if, you, if, you've studied, uh, uh, if you've studied Hearst, you'll, you'll know that his, perhaps his most famous utterance had to do with the, with the uh, prior to the Spanish-American War, uh, where he told one of his reporters or, or photographers who was in Cuba, you furnish the pictures and I'll furnish the war. 
Now, criminologist Robert Reiner had, has recently written, the picture of crime that most people have is not rooted in their own experience, but in highly slanted images derived from mass media. And it is these that misinform popular and political debate. Again, so looking at the old one, I don't do this in my book because I try to, the, the book is, you know, I try to tell a story, I try to make it more accessible to uh, the, the, the non-specialist reader, but you know, you can't help, you can't avoid all your training. I throw a few academic things in there, but uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, you know, this idea that crime stories are basically entertainment, you know, is something I think we need to keep in mind when we're looking at this. Now, the old investigation, this is a murder scene. That's uh, the victim's office. He, he sat right around there when he was killed, right? Second floor of this, this late Victorian building on Canterbury Street in St. John. Uh, the Olin investigation and trial was perhaps the most extensively reported criminal case in New Brunswick history. One result was to put the St. John police force under intense pressure to make an arrest and lay a charge. The police assured the public almost immediately that it was not in danger, which suggested that it had a suspect. But in keeping with standard investigatory procedure, they remained tight-lipped about the details of the case, especially when it came to so-called holdback information. The investigation, arrest, trial, uh, and subsequent matters uh, were covered in detail by print electronic media. During the 2014 preliminary inquiry, the details which could not be reported on, the media was rarely, pre rarely present in the courtroom, but once the trial began, the media was there big time. The CBC alone had two full-time reporters tweeting every day, right? And, and then the other outlets were there as well. Uh, and uh, the use of live tweeting in the courts had only been allowed in New Brunswick starting in 2012 when it was, when it was permitted by Justice William Grant, who uh, was a former law partner of my late father, who, Henry Marquis, uh, who was a lawyer in St. John. In addition to radio, following radio, Twitter, and newspapers, TV news, and online news sites, once the trial began, the public could view court exhibits posted online, such as this. Photographs, videos, and even documents. Olin's admissible, Dennis Olin's admissible 2011 police interview, which maybe some of you have seen on YouTube. The two, it's two hours and 22 minutes long. That's what the jury saw at the trial. After the trial, then the rest of the five hour, complete five hour interrogation was released. And some of it's pretty brutal to watch, right? And you can see that online. Uh, and uh, so these, these are, you know, these are, uh, that's a crime, sh crime scene photo there. Uh, that's the uh, keyboard at the victim's desk. He was killed at his desk, right? That's his main computer with the uh, charge cord for his stolen iPhone that was never found, right? Uh, that's the interior of a car, the car that Dennis Olin uh, was driving the day of the murder and the trunk, right? So these are, these are sort of exhibits, right? Exhibits that uh, were posted by media. Uh, so uh, this was largely a regional story, but it did attract some national attention, Globe and Mail, National Post, Canadian Press. I did one uh, small, quick interview the weekend of the, the, this, the day after the conviction, and it was picked up by 100 newspapers. Right? And then it seemed to kind of die down. And every once in a while, something will flare up like the bail hearing or something like that, and it'll get some national attention. Uh, but it's heavily covered in New Brunswick. Uh, and then, of course, there was the uh, following the verdict, in the winter of 2016, there was an episode of the Fifth Estate, CBC, which you can find online as well. Uh, murder in the Family. This episode uh, gave an overview of the trial just prior to the sentencing. And uh, this episode, whoever committed, this is more a St. John comment, but you might get a kick out of it. Uh, the, the, the Fifth Estate episode committed the cardinal sin in the, in the opinion of people from the St. John era, area of using a Halifax expert to explain the city uh, of St. John <laughs> to, to a national audience. I think, I have to think, you know, I'm born and raised in St. John. I lived in Halifax, you know, met my wife here, got married here. But I think the only thing worse than that for someone from St. John is if someone from Fredericton <laughs> was, was. Okay, you've been to New Brunswick then. I, I take that you've been to New Brunswick. So once the trial began, there was reporting of sloppy police work at the crime scene, which raised the possibility, the possibility that physical evidence had been lost or compromised. This is a sketch of the crime scene. It was a victim laying in a pool of blood. There's his desk, right? Right, so uh, that's, that's a sketch of the, of, of the crime scene. Uh, raised the possibility that physical evidence had been uh, lost or compromised. Although this turned out to have little or no impact on the trial outcome, right, obviously if the jury thought 
that the St. John police force had committed so many errors and had totally so screwed up the crime scene, right, that would have raised sufficient reasonable doubt in their minds that they would have acquitted the defendant. They didn't, right? Maybe when it comes to a new trial, right, maybe that evidence will be more compelling. Uh, but uh, I think one of the reasons we, we were so focused on these details at the time was that it's good stuff to report. You know, it's really good stuff to report. Oh my God, they didn't, test, they didn't touch the test the back door, right? They didn't, they didn't check the back door for fingerprints and uh, DNA or whatever. So, so uh, you know, that gets in the newspaper, it gets on, you know, and, and it's like the, the sound bite of the day on CBC. So I think, I think a lot of it got sucked into that. It turned out to be not really that important, uh, you know, at least, at least the, 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 uh, the first trial. Uh, the details of the case, especially when reported during the trial, encourage people to play detective. I think this is something else, too, this idea of entertainment. People are watching, you know, forensic files and all these shows and uh, true crime books and that type of thing. And uh, I talk about that in the, in the, in the book, uh, you know, Making of a Murderer, uh, Serial, all that, right? And I'm sure there's a few people in this room that have, have uh, done a little bit of uh, watching of too many episodes of crime shows on Netflix late at night. Right? Don't, don't make eye contact with me. Uh, so this, this, this case was full of that type of stuff. You could play detective. Uh, the forensic evidence. What happened to the cell phone? What about the cell phone tower evidence? What about the DNA? What about the computer uh, usage data? This was all important technical, kind of like the silent witness type of evidence, right? Circumstantial evidence that was used by the jury, we can only infer, to, to, to find guilt. And circumstantial, you know, direct, uh, Direct evidence is eyewitness evidence. There wasn't any direct evidence in this case, really. It's all circumstantial, and circumstantial evidence is the type of evidence that on its own does not prove anything. A judge or jury then has to make a determination, uh, you know, link, uh, link, you know, link, make an inference by linking this circum circumstantial uh, evidence uh, together. This is a purely evidential case. Uh, the role of the media is also related to the third point, uh, the intensity, the intensity of public interest. So it's not just the, the, you know, the fact that the media is throwing all the stuff at the public. The public is already talking about the case, right? Uh, and the media is kind of like adding fuel to the fire, so to speak. I've never seen anything like it in St. John. Uh, the truth, according to Oscar Wilde, is rarely pure and never simple. However, juries are tasked with finding the truth or facts based on evidence that is presented and tested in court. We have a system of adversarial justice that we've inherited from the British uh, where arguments are made, evidence is tested, and then the trier of fact, either the judge or the jury, has to make an determination. Jurors are constantly told by trial judges to assess all the evidence, not just a single isolated piece of evidence. Yet many people in St. John, when they had their pet theory about the case, would look at one little, you know, like the back door or, you know, what one little piece of evidence, a, a, a text message or a cell phone call or whatever. Uh, and uh, many people in St. John, even before the trial started in 2015, had strong opinions on the guilt or the innocence of Dennis Olin, on the quality of the police investigation, and on the conduct of the trial. Uh, and, uh, and again, uh, I was fascinated by this. People knew I was trying to work on a book. I was attending court. I would be approached all the time when I went into St. John uh, and uh, people will come up to me and tell me their theories of the case, right? They would tell me what they think what happened, and I noticed that none of them had ever been in the courtroom, right? It was a really compelling, interesting piece of, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of human nature at work. Uh, I should mention that, that, that courtroom uh, point, too. I was also surprised by how many people didn't realize, getting back to our kind of British justice traditions, I didn't, I didn't realize how many people were unaware that you can go into any courtroom you want, right? They said, I, you know, I, are you allowed to go there? They would ask me these questions, you know, can you go? They, they thought that you had to be, you know, almost part of the case or something, right? So a lot of people, again, that's, it's a slice of life, much like most people will never be in a police station, right? Most people will never be in a court of law, right? And they have no idea that the courts are open, right? So anyway. Now, in terms of the, the level of gossip and, that, and connection, St. John has only 65,000 people. Rosse, uh, 12,000. Quispamsis, where I live, 18,000. You know, so there's not a lot of people in the area, right? So you, you know, people tend to know 
the Olins, the people in the police force, right? I mean, whatever, the sheriff's deputies, the lawyers, you know, so people who work for Moosehead, people who work for some of Richard Olin's various business enterprises, uh, people who belong to one, you know, the, one of the two yacht clubs that the Olins belong to, and all the boating people, and all those people, the Conservative Party, you know, you start checking off the list, you've got a lot of, you don't have much separation anymore, right? So that, I think that, that, uh, that uh, leads to the, uh, the intensity as well. Now, to be fair, some of the speculation was a product of what uh, a defense lawyer recently called the exceptional circumstances of the case, which I review in the final chapter of the book. There are a lot of problematic issues to the case in terms of the circumstantial evidence. It's the sort of thing that could drive you crazy, right? Uh, so, so, for example, uh, the somewhat speculative theory uh, of evidence by the Crown uh, the fact that no murder weapon was ever discovered, and this was the most commonly cited uh, type of murder weapon, a drywall hammer, but the judge instructed the jury, you, we can't say that a drywall hammer was used because there was no evidence positively entered to, sh to suggest that, right? The pathologist couldn't or wouldn't say, right? Uh, no evidence of a cleanup of the scene, at the scene, no trace evidence on the suspect's clothing with one major exception, the, the evidence on the, on the brown jacket, no evidence of trace blood or DNA in the suspect's vehicle. No explanation as why the victim's iPhone was missing or what happened to it, right? So all those unknowns in this case. One, and there's another thing, you know, the, the common sense, and again, uh, uh, here's, you know, the back door, the inside, back door and the exterior, all sorts of controversies around this. Uh, here's another sort of common sense view, right? Uh, you know, what, A, was Dennis capable of murder, right? B, was he capable of carrying out a murder and covering almost all traces of it? I mean, at the Court of Appeal, uh, Mr. Gold, the defense lawyer, brought this up again. He suggested that Dennis Olin must have been an incredibly resourceful and clever criminal to carry out this murder and leave no evidence at all except for three little drops of DNA on his father's DNA on the jacket, which could be explained by, quote, well, innocent transfer. Uh, C, was he capable of bashing in his father's head and then going home to his wife in Rosse, changing his clothes and appearing calmly shopping on video camera in suburbia supposedly an hour after the attack? You know, so these are some of the compelling common sense questions that were asked. The Crown's theory was that appearances can be deceiving. And just taking a quotation from their, uh, uh, a quotation from their opening statement, we submit that anyone is capable of doing bad things. And I thought, wait a minute, that sounds very familiar. That sounds very familiar. Uh, remember how I alluded to Netflix earlier? Well, after I started writing the book, I started watching the series Bloodline. Has anyone watched that one? Okay. What's the tagline for Bloodline? Good people do bad things. So again, what's, you know, who came up with that line first, right? So, Anyway, the publicized details of, an ad of the inadequate police investigation, some of which the trial judge acknowledged because he had to by law, right, in his instructions to the jury, were very compelling uh, for citizens predisposed or preconditioned to have negative views of the St. John police force. And again, uh, we have a situation in, uh, in, in New Brunswick where the in influential uh, media outlets, they have very strong uh, editorials, right, and uh, so I, as someone who studies policing, uh, I was always intrigued by uh, these ongoing editorials in the Irving newspapers, uh, you know, slamming the police force. What they're really doing is slamming the police union, right? Because they, they seem to have this war on against the public sector, against unions, and uh, the, the Irving papers are, is this being filmed? I hope it is, uh, are obsessed. <laughs> obsessed over details of a municipal administration. You would think it was a bloody United Nations they're reporting on, not a little city in the Maritimes. Anyway, so public where, you know, if, you, if you're conditioned to all this negativity about the St. John police, suddenly along comes a case where they're not wearing gloves at the scene, they're using the upstairs bathroom outside of the, the, uh, the murder scene, they're not testing the back door, they're not taking notes, you know, this type of thing. And again, this is like heroin for people who are preconditioned to have a negative view of local cops. Uh, anyway, uh, so because of uh, opinion, uh, differences of opinion within the community, which I describe in the book, uh, the strong feelings and intense interest, 
as well as the many unknowns about the case. I was inspired to write a true crime book, maybe inspiration's the wrong word, desperation is probably better, uh, without a conclusion. So uh, it's a little bit different than what we're trained to do as academics or true crime writers. It kind of breaks a fundamental rule. There's no conclusion, right? And uh, so I leave it to the reader. And I've already had some interesting feedback from people. I've had a couple of people who typed up little uh, uh, commentaries on what they think happened and emailed them to me. And I think that's really neat. I, I, if anyone wants to do that to me, uh, for the, I, I'd love to hear back from you on that. Another aspect, uh, 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 another thing about this was that the, uh, I'll get to these lawyers here in a sec. Uh, the combination number one and two led, factors one and two, led to much discussion pro and con of the findings of the jury. Again, I've never seen a case like this. Usually when there's a finding of acquittal or guilt, the, 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 the chat in the community is on the, 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 the convicted person or the acquitted person or the victim. Right? The jury is a neutral factor. Right? The jury is a neutral factor. Right? In this case, there's a lot of talk about the jury. And uh, we have no way of knowing, but this must have created tremendous stress for the jury, uh, criticism by a good chunk of the community. Uh, and they had, you know, they had the grooming schedule of the trial. They had 30 hours of deli de deliberation. Uh, they had the legal requirement for non-disclosure. They couldn't tell anyone, even their husbands or wives or girlfriends or boyfriends. Uh, why uh, they were exposed to graphic testimony, and again I'll come back to this. But in my experience, I've lived in Saint. I was born and raised in Saint John. Now, obviously, when you're a kid, you don't pay much attention to this stuff. But I moved back there in '99, and there's ver rarely any water cooler or coffee shop or bar room uh, staff lounge type conversation about the jury. So again, I'll come back to that. Now, uh, the uh, again we've had other murder cases, manslaughter cases. You know, Justin Bennett case, young man only 18 years old, uh, his uncle, uh, uh, a crack cocaine, crack cocaine addict, came into the house where Justin was living, tried to take a computer modem that Justin and his two younger friends were using to play computer games. There was a fight. Uh, Justin claimed that he stabbed the uncle in self-defense. The uncle died on the way to hospital. Justin was uh, charged with the same crime as Dennis Olin, and he got the same sentence, 10 years. Uh, with no parole eligibility. He was only 18 years old, right? The problem for the defense there, and I heard the, the, uh, ch the final arguments uh, the prior, uh, by the two sides. The, prior for the, the problem for the defense there is that the, uh, the uncle was stabbed six times in the back, right? So it kind of, you know, it kind of goes against the self-defense thing a bit. So, uh, and again, I didn't hear anyone say, hey, gee, that jury, you know? The jury was too harsh, or the jury was not harsh enough, or what in the hell was that jury doing? Uh, so uh, again, every case is different, I realize. And, but uh, getting back to the Olin case, this appears to be the first time where media reported that the provincial government was providing support for jury members in the wake of the trial. And again, I, tend to th I think that this was not because of the graphic photos. And believe me, they are very graphic. I would never show you the photos that we have from this, from this crime scene. Uh, but there are other graphic cases of child murder, child molestation, right? And so I believe a large part of that stress was the stress that they got through the community reaction uh, from part of the community. And again, uh, uh, there's an, just as a little bit of an aside, uh, recently it's reported that a female juror in the 2012 trial of Michael Rafferty has gone to uh, court to seek support from the Ontario Criminal Injuries Compensation Board, board she, this was a Rafferty and his girlfriend were convicted of killing a young girl, eight years old. So the woman claims as a juror, she suffered post-traumatic stress syndrome after the trial. Quote, symptoms have been debilitating, she says, including memory loss, bouts of extreme anger, and a shopping addiction that has drained her retirement savings and children's educational plans. So she applied for the, vic kind of the, the victims of crime fund as a victim of crime, as a juror who sat through a graphic trial and she was denied. So she's taken the government of Ontario to court. So I think there's going to be some interesting things in the future about jurors, counseling, all that type of stuff, right? Anyway, uh, the fourth, I've got to pick, pick, pick up the pace here. The fourth reason, there's only eight to go, oh my gosh. Uh, the legal quest by the media outlet, for media outlets for, to publish search warrant related information prior to the actual trial. I'm just, I'm just going to mention this briefly, but it, uh, I haven't done the research on this 
publication bans are not my thing as a, as a non-lawyer legal prof, but uh, no, the, the, the media is constitutionally entitled to publish, publish information about court cases, but there are exceptions. You know, judges can impose bans, usually preliminary inquiries of bans, for example, cases involving uh, youth and that type of thing. Uh, and the, pub, the ban refers to publication. So anyone could, you know, a lot of people can go into the court and get the documents, you can copy them, that type of thing. You just can't write a story about them, put them on the internet, and that type of thing. So uh, what was interesting about this case is that uh, uh, the, uh, the CBC and the Telegraph Journal uh, fought in court for the right to uh, publish certain details from search warrants and related documents prior to an arrest being made. And this came out in stages as a detail in the book. It was well covered in the media. It's kind of like a form of legal strip tease, if you will. So well before Dennis Olin's arrest in November 2013, a lot of the key elements, I mean, they, no, they weren't always right about their, 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 their assumptions, but a lot of the key elements of the, the, the case for the St. John Police Force were revealed through the media. And uh, so, for example, uh, in stages it was revealed that uh, uh, it was... Uh, it was a murder, not, you know, uh, not a manslaughter, uh, that, the, that the accused, uh, that they had one accused, that the accused owed a lot of money to the, to, to the victim, uh, that there was a mistress, right, that the accused was the victim's son, you know, okay, there's, how many sons are there? Oh, there's only one, okay, so, so, uh, so again, uh, the unsealing of that warrant information challenged a basic orthodoxy in policing circles. And of course, it was, it, was, it was opposed not only by the police, but by the Crown attorneys and by the Olin family, right, in court. Uh, the basic orthodoxy is you try, it, you try to release only what will not harm the investigation, right? And that was an argument that the St. John Police Force tried to make. Okay, uh, prominence of the defense team. Here we get to the, I call this the kind of the reservoir dog shot, but uh, uh, very prominent, uh, the two main defense lawyers on the left, the, uh, and the junior counsel, uh, third from the left, and this is uh, the defense team walking back and forth from court uh, in, in the fall of 2015. Uh, Gary Miller uh, on the left, uh, uh, very experienced uh, senior uh, uh, Gary Miller QC uh, lawyer in Fredericton. He was, in the past, he's been involved with the Hatfield drug case, the Romero, the Romero murder case, which I think was an extradition case, and the Noah Augustine murder case amongst many others. Uh, Alan Gold uh, is second from the left, and he's one of the better known defense uh, lawyers in Canada. Uh, he is uh, uh, author of his own annotated criminal code, uh, author of a, a book dealing with uh, what he calls junk science, how to defend against junk science, forensic experts in court and that type of thing. A very highly sought after speaker for legal audiences. And uh, according to press accounts, Mr. Gold has won three cases before the Supreme Court of Canada in one year. Jamie McConnell, young, a junior lawyer from Cox Palmer, Bill T. Q. C., the Olin family lawyer, and a friend of the defendant. Uh, again, this is an interesting thing. This was a very expensive case. So one of the questions, we, there's two questions you know, we'd love to have answered. How much did it cost the defense and who paid? Right? So, uh, so uh, now that led to a lot of fatalism in the community that high paid lawyers we're going to, how often do you hear this? Here's the common sense thing again. High paid, law. he'll never be convicted, right? Uh, we, we know he did it, whatever, but high paid lawyers are gonna get him off on a technicality, right? Well, you go to law school, it's not just a technicality, it's called the law, right? So, so anyway, but uh, obviously that theory didn't work, did it? Uh, but what's interesting, a legal aid lawyer mentioned to me one day that uh, in defense of duty counsel on legal aid, Yes, they too can win big cases because uh, there's, I know of at least one fairly recent case where a duty counsel won, uh, over, had, a, had a murder case uh, in 2015, the New Brunswick Court of Appeal overturned a murder case of Mr. McKenna from Gary, New Brunswick on the basis of the trial judge had failed to instruct the jury properly on the, on the difference between murder and manslaughter. And that was Margaret Gallagher, who's not Alan Gold and not Gary Miller, she's duty counsel in St. John, right? So now they, they lost at the Supreme Court of Canada, but they, you know, they did win at the, at the appeal court. So it's not always the case that, you know, the, 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 uh, what Napoleon would call the big battalions uh, win. Um, now, the, the, so, okay, what else makes the case different or interesting? The length of the preliminary inquiry and pretrial proceedings in 2014-15, the preliminary inquiry 
ran from May 12th uh, to August 7th, uh, October 7th, 2014, heard most of the Crown witnesses who would testify at the trial. The transcript was 5,000 pages long. The transcript of the preliminary inquiry was 5,000 pages long. I was lucky enough to be able to sit through most of that because it was in the summer. The decision by Judge Ronald LeBlanc of the provincial court to send the case to trial for second degree murder took 75 minutes to read in court, right? I don't know if that's unusual. I think it is. Uh, Excuse me. So then there were the voir dires and the pretrial matters. Uh, and uh, it's interesting that despite all that, prior to the, uh, getting back to the, the decision sent to the court, the defense purported to be shocked that Judge LeBlanc was sending this to trial. Right at the time, Gary Miller said, I've never seen anything like this in my life, and I've been practicing law for 37, or whatever, 37 years. And even recently, uh, either at the Supreme Court of Canada or the Brunswick Court of Appeal, Mr. Gold said, we always took the position that there was no case, meaning for the prosecution. In 2015, prior to the trial, there was a series of voir dires, series of voir dires or hearings and rulings on evidence by trial judge Justice Walsh, including on whether the, the issue of the, uh, there's the, the crown, by the way, PJ Venio, who was brought back out of retirement to be the lead crown when uh, the initial lead crown had a drop out because of uh, ill health and uh, Mr., uh, Mr. Weber, Mr. Wilbur. Um, and uh, I'll leave that, that's, the, where the, that's where the brown jacket was dry cleaned. Uh, so there was a, 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 so a series of rulings on the contentious issues. The most contentious was whether or not the accused Hugo Bross brown sports coat, which was dry cleaned here the day after he was interrogated, should have been sent to Halifax for testing by the RCMP crime lab. Right? Uh, the defense wanted this evidence excluded on the grounds that sending it to Halifax under the terms of the warrant, as they understood it, violated Mr. Olin's charter rights, right? And they, they tried their hardest to get that jacket excluded from the trial. Why? Because it was the only forensic evidence that connected the victim to uh, the accused in terms of a method, bludgeoning, right? It's contentious, you know, uh, but uh, uh, anyway, uh, so the judge, as a, as a gatekeeper, then made a series of rulings, and uh, he argued that uh, the jacket could go in. And uh, so, it's, and again, uh, we'll have to see what happens to that jacket uh, when there's a second trial. The size of the jury pool. This was the, uh, I'm going to skip ahead to some of these. That's, that's just a cell phone uh, uh, propagation uh, uh, map. There was a, a piece of evidence at court showing where the uh, missing cell phone might have uh, been located the night of the murder. That's a couple of the, uh, the RCMP forensic DNA people who testified during the trial. Uh, I pointed out the, in the book the irony of the, uh, uh, and this camera is still running, right, that the tough on crime Harper government cl closed three out of the six RCMP crime labs. That's how they fought crime, right, uh, including the one in Halifax, right? So, but these were uh, uh, Joy Kersey and Mr. S I forget the, Sarzansky, I think. Anyway, they were, they were DNA experts. Here's the brown jacket, right? Uh, here we go. The largest jury pool in Canadian history to, to, de to that date, I think, I think it still holds the record. 5,000 notices were issued. Most people sought exemptions, but still 1,100 people showed up at the hockey rink here, which is also where you go to see, you know, Drake or whatever. Uh, and uh, I, I had to see Drake with my son once there. Uh, and 1,100 showed up for preliminary jury selection, and this is where the accused also entered his plea of not guilty, right? in September 2015, more than four years after the discovery of the body. Uh, the, uh, again, really interesting, there's only 140,000 people in St. John and Kings counties from where the jury is, uh, is, uh, is uh, drawn. Uh, and uh, so uh, again, the 1,100 were sorted in the groups. They were taken one group at a time to nearby law courts for final selection in front of the accused. And uh, the question started, people started to ask me, can Dennis Olin get a fair trial in St. John, given all the publicity and the fact there's only so many people? I, I, think, he can, I think they can get a jury uh, because it only took them two days last time to get a jury. If they had to, they could probably move to Moncton, which is only an hour and a half away, right? Uh, now the question, is the super jury pool a new trend? I know there's some other cases like the uh, Luca Magnata case and some of those other high profile cases where there have been some pretty large pools, but just to bring things back into perspective, the ongoing 
criminal negligence trial, the two young boys who were killed by the python snake in northern New Brunswick. Very tragic. They, Campbellton, I think, f four, or is it Bathurst? And northern, 400 potential jurors. The, uh, the, uh, the murder trial, uh, Bailey White murder trial, I think it's Bailey, anyway, the, the, the murder trial involving young people in Moncton, 600, right? So that's not, that's not 5,000, right? So uh, anyway, uh, the length of the trial. The trial ran from December uh, to December 2015. It sat for a total of, 65, total of 65 days. This was not the longest criminal trial in New Brunswick. A veteran lawyer told me that there was a land fraud trial back in the 70s that was longer. Also, recently we had the Jay Tornado drug trial in St. John, which ran for 65 days and resulted in the uh, conviction of two local men for drug trafficking, uh, possession, and conspiracy. You may have heard about this one. This is where the RCMP gave uh, the St. John Drug Squad or whatever, these blackberry, uh, blackberries. And then they had an informant, a paid informant within uh, the, uh, the drug network in St. John. And they said, hey, we've got these blackberries and they're encrypted. The police can never crack, you know, because, you know, the, this is a nice thing about blackberries, that you, they can't be hacked, you know. The police will never be able to hack our, our, our messages. Of course, the phones were all, the phones were directly feeding into the RCMP servers and they downloaded 30,000 emails, right, to use to convict these guys. It wasn't an easy conviction. Anyway, uh, so, uh, so this was a long trial though, the Olin trial, and uh, this is Justice Walsh on the left, and uh, the jury, again, the, the, they have to kind of do these impressionistic sketches of the jury, right, but this is my friend, artist Carol Taylor from Rosse, and she, uh, these, these, these images are in the book. Uh, so as Chief Justice Drapeau said during the Olin appeal, this was an expensive trial, but the trial cost of St. John Police Force and provincial government is not known. Now I've been asked the question, you know, will they go ahead with a second prosecution? And I think they have to. I think there'd be a huge human cry if they didn't go with, a, you know, with a second prosecution. Uh, you know, they did win the first time after all, and there's a guy who's been murdered. So, so uh, we'll have to see what happens. So the length of the judge's charge to the jury. You can find this online. Judge, just, Justice Walsh, following the appearance of the last two witnesses, last witness who was the accused, gave the jury a break and gave the two parties his draft charge. This was totally new to me because as, as an historian, I usually study systems. You know, I don't study like one case. And uh, I didn't know that when the judge does his or her charge, they give the two sides in the trial the draft. I want your feedback. And it's kind of like a, a bargaining what goes over a few days and they met for three different uh, periods, three days uh, in between the before the trial was actually over. Uh, and so in a sense, the, 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 uh, the defense and the Crown help write that charge in a way, you know, although I mean, he has final sign off and anything. And uh, so I, I was fascinated by that. And of course, the other thing I didn't know, I thought, boy, that's a brilliant judge. And of course, he's a smart man, but they have manuals. They have manuals. It's like a template, you know, different jury charges. This is how you do it, right? So not to take away from the training and experience of those judges, but uh, anyway, uh, what they're trying to do is summarize the evidence, the arguments of the two sides, and also to give any cautions to the jury about evidence and things like that. And uh, the judge does not have to review all the evidence in the case, but what they're trying to do is avoid an appeal as well, right? Uh, this is a 200-page document. It took 1.5 days to read, right? And I was furiously taking notes, and at the very end, the judge says, oh, by the way, this document will be made available <laughs> to the, to the uh, media <laughs> and people. Anyway, so uh, the document is a very useful summary of the case, and it can be found online, I think, on one of the CBC sites. So if you, if you, if you want to find out more about the nuts and bolts of the case, here is the trial judge's uh, summation. Uh, the tenth, uh, the show of support at Dennis Olin's sentencing hearing in February 2016. So let's just back it up. He's, he's found guilty on December 19th uh, in, in St. John, been over Christmas. There's a, you know, they come back in the new year, there's a pre-sentence report, just like any criminal, pre-sentence report, you know, recommendations for sentencing, things like that. So what was really interesting, I haven't, I haven't tracked this, but I think it was somewhat unprecedented, the number of letters of support from friends and family in the community, 70, 70 character reference letters were filed in court prior to sentencing. Some of them had to be thrown out because they were inappropriate, because they criticized the verdict. To the great umbrage of the trial judge, right, who said, a jury trial is not a popularity contest, right? 
I don't care if he's a nice guy, basically. The jury is the judge here, and the jury found him guilty, right? So anyway, uh, two, uh, this, a pre-sentence report to two victim impact statements were, uh, which, in interesting, were kind of collateral damage victims. They were the guys who were working down below in the building when the murder took place. They didn't hear anything, but they, they had the shock of realizing that their associate, Mr. Olin, was possibly murdered in the second floor when they were working down below. And one of them did, uh, neither of them saw the body. Sorry, no, one of them did see the body the next morning. He was the second person to see it. So they, they entered very compelling, uh, uh, heartfelt uh, statements, but more about what they experienced. They, they, weren't saying, you know, they weren't saying that they agreed with the verdict or disagreed. Uh, the recommendation of the jury, which, which is for the most liberal sentence, a minimum of 10 years before parole eligibility. This reflected the view of the, the trial judge who seemed to suggest that because of the family support, the fact that Mr. Olin had no criminal record, he was not otherwise known for being violent, he was not a flight risk and that type of thing. So he agreed uh, with that, uh, that minimum of 10 years. What was unprecedented in my knowledge is several dozen supporters, presumably recruited by social media, gathered at a breakfast in the downtown hotel and marched on the snowy day uh, uh, to the courthouse, not all of them, to, in, to the law courts, not all of them entered the, not all of them entered the uh, corridor, but again, I found this really intriguing. Uh, I don't know if you get this in Nova Scotia, but New Brunswick, we would get it, obviously. It hasn't been confirmed or denied, but I'm 90% sure that that person right there is the conservative me uh, member of the Legislative Assembly for West St. John, a serving politician coming to, uh, you know, not into the court building, but in the crowd, right? And former employer of Lisa Oland, right? And so again, eh, uh, I'll talk about that a bit. After. And again, has, I haven't been sued by her yet, but I haven't, it hasn't been denied either. So, uh, so I detail, uh, the, and the other thing too is not just the numbers, but the names on these, on these letters, some very well connected business people and political people around St. John. Derek Oland wrote on the letterhead of Musa Breweries, right? Uh, so the uncle. Uh, so uh, many of them claim to be involved because of the personal connection with the family. Uh, and uh, remember also, this was a family of the victim, right? So it just adds that extra complicated layer. So again, I just, I just put in this out there and I can maybe, I could say this a little bit, run out of the room, but imagine the media and public reaction of young Gameshi had been convicted of his charges and a sitting senator of Canada spoke to the media outside of the courthouse in support of the Gameshi family. That's what happened in this case. Uh, similarly, what if using an Ontario, or if the local MPP, that's what they call them in Ontario, marched to the courthouse in the crowd of supporters in the snow outside. Similarly, what would be the reaction if two local churches in Knighton Junction, Alberta, encouraged the congregation to keep the family of Travis, Travis Vader in their prayers the day after he was convicted of murdering Lyle and Marie McCann. That's what happened. Two churches of Rossi Common, the Sunday after Mr. Olin is convicted, asked the parishioners to keep the family, the Olin family, in their prayers. Where are we going with this now? And finally, what would the public think if a character reference letter for convicted murderer Dylan Millard uh, so what would the public think that if, uh, if a character reference letter was written for sentencing uh, on behalf of convicted murderer Dylan Millard by a recently retired justice of the Ontario Court of Appeal? There was a, there was a, a, a Court of Appeal judge from Rossi who had only retired in 2013, you know, two, year, two years after the... The, again, I mean, this is all, it's all fair in love and war, right? It's all, you know, it, people can write letters for people. But again, just the optics. And I, so I put welcome either to the Olin case or welcome to New Brunswick, right? So, okay, we're almost done. The bail hearing issue. Uh, this is a bit out of reverse. Last two things, the bail hearing and the appeal. Uh, now, the appeal comes before the bail, uh, the final bail thing, but I, I'm going to mention the, the bail hearing uh, first. Uh, in two, 2016, the defense fi filed a notice of appeal. Uh, it also signaled that it would request that his client be released on bail pending, pending the appeal. In some cases, convicted murderers spend two or three years in prison before they get their appeal argued. In some cases, they win their appeal, they get a new trial. Rarely, they're acquitted. In some cases, 
they get a new trial and they lose. Right? Now, this had never been done before in New Brunswick. There was no record of a convicted murder ever being released on bail pending an appeal. So they were trying to break new ground here of the Court of Appeal, and they tried twice and they lost. Right? Uh, uh, and uh, the, uh, it's happened in other provinces. Uh, uh, so in the first bail hearing before Justice Richard was not successful under Section 679.3 of the Criminal Code, Richard made his decision based on what an informed member of the public would think of the post-trial release of a convicted murder. He agreed that the appeal was not frivolous, which is language, I think, from that section of the criminal code. It was clearly arguable that there was a good chance you know, that the appeal could be argued. But, uh, and there was also, he also agreed there was no evidence that Mr. Olin was a danger to the public or a flight risk. But he ruled that Olin had failed to meet the public confidence required. In other words, the public would lose confidence in the justice system if a convicted murderer was released on bail prior to his appeal. That decision was appealed to the Brunswick Court of Appeal under Session 680 in April 2016, the Chief Justice and two colleagues ruled that Justice Richard had not made legal errors and the decision would stand. The Olin team then appealed to the Supreme Court of Canada, which to the surprise of many observers in late June 2016 agreed to hear the matter. Why? Uh, well, there's no uniformity in provincial appeal courts on this issue. It varies from province to province. And also a large percentage of second degree murderers who have appealed their convictions have won new trials or have been acquitted. In the words of the Criminal Lawyers Association of Ontario, which was one of the uh, uh, interveners at the Supreme Court, trial courts commit errors, right? The Sup Supreme Court hearing took place on October 31, and the appellant and the respondent, as well as four interveners, made submissions in the space of two hours. Again, as I mentioned earlier, I was quite impressed by being in that building. Uh, they grappled with the issue of public perception. On the one hand, it was argued, a court system that does not allow reasonable access to bail for people seeking an appeal of their conviction could jeopardize public confidence. On the other hand, there was a danger that a ruling, however legally correct, that uh, released someone on bail prior to their appeal could be interpreted by the public, this is what the defense said, quote, as just a murderer being released. They were troubled by that public perception that the public would lose sight of the larger legal principles here, right? Uh, now, this court talk about public confidence in the justice system was interesting to me as an academic who studies public opinion in the justice system. Uh, you probably already know that, it's, 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 again, it's not necessarily an accurate, an accurate thing. It's this, this common sense view that the public has about certain institutions. The public has very low opinions of the courts, <laughs> very, very low. Supreme Court of Canada, however, does better, right? Uh, and uh, so, uh, for example, in 2014, only 40% of Canadians in one poll had confidence in the criminal courts. And this was up from only 20% confidence in 2012. On the other hand, the Supreme Court of Canada has an overall positive rating much higher, for example, 60% in 2015. So we're awaiting that decision. Uh, so Dennis was convicted and uh, he uh, spent, I was surprised at this, I, I, no one's been able to explain why. I, 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 I speculated in the book that when he was convicted as a se second degree murderer of no criminal record, he would have been in Dorchester, medium security. Apparently he was in Renus, maximum security, and I don't know why. Uh, but uh, it's still in New Brunswick, but it's, you know, it's a more hardcore place. And so uh, the Court of Appeal, the pros and cons, there's the Supreme Court, uh, there's the interior of the Supreme Court, this is from the actual case of, of October 31. And, uh, and then here's the Court of Appeal building, the justice, uh, the law courts in Fredericton where the, the appeal was argued, the, the appeal of the conviction, right, not of the bail. So the pros and cons of live coverage of criminal trials, uh, interesting. Uh, and again, I think this was the first live streaming of any sort of criminal type court that I know of in New Brunswick. I could stand corrected. And, uh, but again, this was not a criminal trial. It was reviewing not the guilt or innocence of Dennis Olin, but trial fairness. Did he get a fair trial? And uh, the decision, but in the meantime, uh, they made a decision that they would, they would televise or, or live cast the, uh, the Court of Appeal uh, proceedings. And the reason seems to be one of public access is a very small courtroom, and they only had so many seats, and there's a law school in Fredericton too. And uh, my colleague, Nicola Byrne, was trying to get some of her law students in there, and there's very few seats in, in this room. So I think it's partly because of that public access, the controversy about the crowded courtroom, that they agreed to do live cast of the, uh, of the uh, 
of those proceedings. And I'm not sure if that's going to catch on, but uh, I kind of applaud. I know there's a debate about, you know, ever since the day of court TV and uh, uh, O.J. Simpson and, and the taught mom in all those cases, uh, that uh, there's this argument that lawyers are going to be performing, you know, they're not going to be being real lawyers. On the other hand, you hear that they might be better behaved, right? Because I've heard some lawyers say some pretty wild things in court, right? Because there's no one around. Uh, so anyway, uh, but uh, better for worse, that was, uh, that was uh, uh, live streamed. And uh, again, uh, that, uh, as people probably know, Dennis was acquitted. Not acquitted, sorry. He, he, the conviction was quashed on one of the eight grounds, uh, uh, an aspect of post-offense conduct. Uh, post-offense conduct, and there's the actual picture. That's Mr. Gold. You can see that you know, the room is not very big. Uh, uh, the po and so the, the, they appealed on eight grounds. They, the, the, uh, the one ground that the, the only ground really that the, the Court of Appeal spoke to, and they haven't issued a written uh, uh, decision yet, was this issue of post offense conduct. And again, if there's any lawyers or, or law students here, please forgive my layperson's understanding of this. But uh, Dennis Olin, when he was interviewed by the police the night the, the, night the body was found, told him that he had worn a, a blue blazer the day of the crime. Now in the book I explain it's possible that he was mistaken and not lying because the day the, day the body was found, you see at 8 o'clock in the morning, that's a blue blazer. It's 8 o'clock in the morning, he's in the Kent's building supplies in Rosse, and this is about an hour before his father's body is found. Uh, 6.30, 7 o'clock that night, he's in the box with the police and they ask him, what were you wearing? And he says, a blue blazer, khaki pants, whatever. The police find out later through video an eyewitness that he's wearing a brown blazer. And then later they find the DNA on the blazer, so it all sort of becomes part of their uh, circumstantial evidence case. Now, the appeal court, and again, it's a very subtle argument, the appeal court using case law uh, agreed with the defense that the judge's uh, uh, final, uh, final uh, instructions to the jury should have cautioned the jury that if they interpreted Dennis Olin's statement as a lie, that, not, that is not good enough to be uh, probative evidence, right? The lie, in his case law backs this up apparently, the lie it has to be corroborated with other evidence that goes to the police investigation in order for it to be used as probative evidence. Just the fact that it's a lie, is, you know, a possible lie is not good enough. Again, it's a very subtle argument. I'm still struggling with it myself. But a lawyer explained it to me this way uh, on a break from court. I could, I could be wearing I could tell the police I was wearing a blue blazer, right? But the reason I told the police I'm wearing the blue, I wore the blue blazer is not because I murdered my father in the brown blazer. It could be because, because I have other reasons uh, to lie about wearing that blazer. It could have been given to me by my mistress. I could have stolen it from Frenchies, whatever, right? So again, it's, 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 it's kind of an abstract thing. Now, the average member of the public is going to say, whoa. Uh, he was acquitted on, no, he wasn't acquitted, uh, but the trial was deemed to be unfair because of, you know, uh, a sentence that could have been added to the judge's 200-page uh, charge, right? So again, I'll leave it to you, you know, future law students and other people to determine whether, how valid that is, but right now it stands, right? He was acquitted, he goes back, the, the clock is reset, not acquitted, the conviction was quashed, uh, he goes back to where he was in November 2013. He didn't have to be released on bail because he regained the presumption of innocence. So it's interesting, they still went ahead with the bail uh, f fight in Ottawa, though, for two reasons. One was the, large, the broad, broader constitutional, not constitutional issue, but the broader national issue. And then the defense did raise what they call the, what if something unpleasant happens in the future, meaning if he's convicted again. It would be nice to have a bail ruling for people like this. And, uh, so uh, again, this post-conduct evidence has been uh, regarded as a, a very ambiguous type of evidence uh, for, for the courts and the case law uh, seems to support this need for independent evidence other than the accused statement before a possible lie can be seen as a concocted lie. So this, uh, got a little bit longer than I wanted to, but that's, this uh, concludes my review of why the Olin case is significant for legal history in New Brunswick and perhaps of Canada and I'll try to give you a little bit about the case, some of the details. On December 5th, 2016, Dennis Olin will appear in the St. John Law Courts to be charged, once again, with a second-degree murder of his father. 
And so I end with a question, where will we all be three years from now? Thank you. And before I take questions, I just want to say one thing. Don't forget the, the uh, nice young guy from the bookmark hauled all those books up here. You know, you wouldn't want them to carry all those books back, would you? You know, so if you have any like grandmothers and people like that, they love this stuff. Buy it. I'm just going to get, for people who are not familiar with St. John, this shot was done by my friend Jim Turnbull, who has a drone business. So we did this in the summer. He launched his drone, you know, and we took some shots. So here is the, uh, uh, so here is, uh, uh, that's Canterbury Street, a little bit of a shade here. Uh, that's Tandy's restaurant with video evidence from there. That is the building where the murder took place. That's the back door area and the little alleyways that connect up to Germain. That's Germain. That's the Union Club. That's, uh, yeah, the Union Club and, Ger and Gorman Nason Law Firm. Uh, I think that is a building that Lisa and Dennis Olin ended up buying in the fall of 2013. And that's the murder building, right? So it's just, just a weird coincidence maybe, but it's just, it shows you how small St. John is. This is where the victim parked his car spot number 12 or whatever, and that, uh, that's where his car was parked the morning of the murder. And uh, that's Princess Street, right? And the waterfront's just down here. Uh, if you know the bar area, that's O'Leary's Irish Bar in St. John, different restaurants around here. Yeah, so this is the area, right? And so what happened on that, in this whole area, uh, between 5.45 and 8 o'clock, on the night of the murder is hugely significant for either the defense or the crown in terms of the timeline and that type of thing. And that's, you know, that, that timeline is uh, very intriguing and I talk about that in the last chapter. Anyway, so I just thought I'd give you that little explanation. I'm gonna open it up now for any questions or, or comments people might have. Yeah? While you have that picture up, yeah. your, your book mentions about the lawyer, the female lawyer who was on the way to dinner at eight o'clock. Yeah. Now that was referred to in the Herald yeah. as well, uh, a little different circumstances, but yeah. I think the Herald said she heard something from her office window. Is it possible? Yeah. And I guess why was the why did defense pick up on that? I don't know. But actually I heard I heard the uh, I heard the defense was a friend of mine just phoned me last night when I was coming down that something appeared in the in the Chronicle and uh, and again I don't know if you hear earlier but uh, they, that same piece described me as a law prof, so I, I wouldn't, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, but yeah, but she, uh, I, didn't, I didn't use her name because I, did, I didn't want to put the pressure on her, but I, I, I know her name and I know the law firm she worked with. I, I was told that she was on the street with her daughter walking down Princess, and now in the book, it's kind of a typo. I said that they were at the corner of Princess and Germain, but they're actually closer to Princess and Canterbury. There's a murder building. And they claimed to have heard two men having a wild argument about 7.20, 7.25-ish as they were walking to the restaurant. The reason they knew of their timeline is they had uh, a 7.45 dinner reservation down, uh, there's Grand and Alley, down here, down on Prince William, which is the uh, Water Street. Anyway, there, there's a, it's, yeah, Prince William, uh, there's a nice bistro restaurant and they had reservations there, right? They were, the defense and the uh, police knew about them. Uh, her name came up in the preliminary inquiry, right? And I would have been totally justified to use it, but I just thought, nah, I'm not gonna, you know, I'll just, I'll just put it in as a, as a you know, a, 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 a something that's left over from, that, didn't, that the jury didn't hear about, right? And I think now, from what I understand, the uh, defense and different people, defense are, seem to be talk, talking a lot to the media. I don't know why. Right? I, don't, I don't know if they're trying to uh, seed the ground for the next trial. I don't know. But uh, this could have been their witness to call. So if, if it's compelling, it was, it's kind of uh, a boo-boo on their part, I think, right? It's we'll find strange. out. Maybe she wasn't credible. I don't just Well, I, yeah. Because between that and the fellows that worked at the print store, yeah. I mean, that seems to congeal. And they didn't, they didn't hear anything. Uh, but uh, they didn't hear anything. From, they didn't hear anything, uh, any yelling. She heard yelling. And the other thing is, like, it's... It's, I think she would be a hugely credible witness because she's a, she's a middle-aged lawyer with a university-aged daughter, right? So, you know, I think that would be hugely credible. And, uh, but again, I don't know, I, and they didn't give a full statement to the police. And uh, yeah, I haven't had a chance to check out that uh, the story, but a friend of mine did tell me that apparently my book did not 
have anything about that anecdote that you just mentioned, which you read in my book. So there's another reason that strike-bound newspapers aren't always a good source of accurate reporting. Anyway, but yeah, that's, that's certainly a, a thing that, and who knows what else. I mean, the one, thing that, one thing the Crown has, the Crown has a witness. This is an apartment building right here. In many of these buildings, I don't know if they like this in, in Halifax, these buildings were built after the big fire in 1877. Many of these buildings share a common wall. You know, it's just a weird thing they did back in the day, right? So there's a guy who's lived in this building. Now I know it looks like there's a, there's a, there's a gap there, but uh, it's, more, it's more of a common wall. And there's a guy who lives in this building, and he was interviewed by the police. He was in his apartment all night. He claims to hear a lot of noises through the day and stuff like that coming from uh, 52 Annabelle, and he didn't, hear a, he didn't hear a thing. So it's, you know what I mean? But you know, how many witnesses do you need on this side versus how many on the other side. But yeah, it is, it's one of those intriguing things that the jury never heard. And uh, I have, you know, I know half the lawyers in St. John, and they were coming up to me and telling me about this, and I said, I already know, right? I'm just not using her name. So, thanks. Yes? Do you have any thoughts about why the defense didn't make more of the fact that they missed over the left hand? I mentioned in the book that there was no testimony uh, there was no testimony from the pathologist. He couldn't say, it's not like you see in the TV shows, you know, or Sherlock Holmes. This pathologist could not say what type of weapon it was. Uh, on the other hand, he wasn't asked in court. Uh, and uh, he also couldn't say anything about the handedness of the attacker. Now, one thing, my friend mentioned this last night as well. He told me that this comes up in the, uh, in the uh, Chronicle Herald piece. And I said, well, you know, I wanted to find out, this is going to sound a little weird, but I wanted to find out without getting myself into a, a lather or getting my adrenaline worked up, how long would it take to hit an object 40 times, right? So I went out in the backyard a couple times with my hatchet and I have an old stump and I'm left-handed. Again, this is totally non-scientific because I'm just one guy out of, you know, billions. When I use a hammer or a hatchet, I use my right hand. You know, so just because you write with your left hand doesn't mean. But again, getting back to that, you know, that never came up. Uh, it never came up because there was no forensic evidence entered about anything about the nature of the attack, right? Uh, the, 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 t the evidence was more about how much blood may have been there, right? But it, maybe it's hinting at where they're going with the defense if, if, if people are talking about this in media. It's very interesting because prior to the trial, this, you know, not, none of this stuff was out there, right? So. There will be now, and it just seems yeah. like, you know, any one of these things, you know, you can count them, and it has to be beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah. I just can't imagine he's going to get convicted. No, I don't know. I. And what I find disturbing about the whole case is uh, last year when he was, was found guilty, um, I was in line at a coffee shop just down here in Halifax, and the people in front of me were saying, oh, well, you know, it's... Uh, uh, it was the jury, you know, they, you know, people in St. John, you know, they don't like the, the Irvings, the McCains, and the Olins, you know, they're rich, and, you know, and here's this guy, you know, a spoiled little rich kid, and, uh, and he's got, you know, this, you know, Hugo Boss jacket, and, and, the, and the jury, just because they don't like the establishment of New Brunswick, that found him guilty. You know, I'm standing there listening to this, and I'm just thinking, my gosh, you know, a good personal bias of a jury, um, but that's just, that haunts me. I, I yeah, don't we don't know, we don't know. I, I, I mean, at the time, too, I was part of the, uh, you know, because I was, I was in the media, I was one of the, you know, I'm shocked, but it was, I was more, uh, the, the, the reasonable doubt, and, the, and the, I thought the burden of the crown, but, you know, if you get a chance to read the book, you'll see, I go back and I revisit, I try to infer why the jury uh, may have come to his determination, ultimately we never know. And what I centered on, and again, this is totally inference, what I centered on was uh, if you have a case where uh, the circumstantial evidence can go either way, it had to be something about his testimony and, he, and, and Mr. Owen as a witness. That had to be key, right? And that's hard to quantify, right? So, so uh, and again, I just infer. And uh, so... Uh, and again, so that could mean another jury with that intermixture of people and personalities could look at the same evidence, right? It's really, it's, you know, it's human nature to kind of, you know, the Monday morning uh, quarterback, right? Thing to try to, you know, what did the defense do wrong? 
uh, what did the, what did the you know what did the crown do wrong or right, and uh, so uh, but uh, you know the jury you know the jury can't give its reasons, and uh, you know they deliberated for 30 hours and. You know, they sat there for 65 days, and they, their experienced counsel, as the judge said at the appeal, experienced counsel on both sides, right? So, but yeah, I do, I do throw in this possibility of reverse class discrimination, uh, and I, I use the Menendez. You know, that's, that's a way over the top example, right? But we don't have, we don't have research on juries in Canada because we can't do it, right? The only thing you'll see is mock juries, right? So, so uh, but, uh, you know, we'll never know, but... but uh, you know, at, on the one hand, the other hand, the, uh, there, there are many average people in St. John who sympathize with, with Dennis Olin and his family who are not wealthy people. I meet them all the time. And when I, it's interesting that when I came home, I went out one night, when I came back with my theory of the book, I developed the theory of where I was going with the book, uh, I went out one night to uh, go to the drugstore to get something and I ran into this really nice sweet old lady who came up to me and said, they can't convict that nice young man you know, of, of this crime, he's, he's just a nice young man. So I went back and told my wife, I can't, you know, I can't, I, I don't think I could do it anyway because the evidence is so uh, fuzzy, but I, you know, I, I told my wife, I can't come down on either side because there's gonna be people with such strong feelings and they're, up, they're in about three different camps, right? So, but yeah, I can be, you know, I, I take your point about, about the, the conviction, but, uh, I also feel that if I was a defense, I'd still be very worried. As a young reporter said to me, uh, within hours of the, uh, the, the conviction being quashed, it's kind of weird that the, that the Olin family is really happy that he's going to be facing another murder trial. That's their happiness, right? And that's totally unpredictable. And, and uh, it's totally unpredictable. And I think, I think they're going to have a really tough, you know, maybe there'd be some other evidence, uh, and who knows what the crown can come up with, right? But I think, you know, my my, my gut feeling is they're going to have a tough uh, a tough job because uh, I think that brown jacket with the DNA is now protected, basically by the court of appeal. I haven't had a chance to talk to lawyers about that because that was one of the grounds of the appeal, and the the, the court of appeal said no, it doesn't matter to us. So either it's if it's not protected, the very it, you know, there's going to be a strong argument. Is going to be needed to try to get that brown jacket excluded. As I point out in the book, and the media wasn't there to hear it because they weren't covering the uh, preliminary inquiry unless they were able to buy the transcript. During the preliminary inquiry, during the voir dires, when the when the discussing whether the uh, brown jacket would be admitted or thrown out as a violation of, of Section 24 or whatever the charter, uh, or Section 8, whatever it is, uh, the Crown said. There's no jacket, there's no case, right? So the case would collapse without that jacket. And that's, so I, I, I feel that's gonna be the battleground in the next trial, so. Who will it really take a trial? Could it be like before they even go to trial? I'm, I'm a law student, I'm learning, but when they do look at the evidence, could they look at that differently and realize that, you know, it wasn't that the warrant, uh, you know, was invalid? Well, the judge issued a seventy-five. The, the trial judge issued a seventy-five-page decision. But don't you start over again? Yeah, but and the defendant probably won't uh, waive his right to a preliminary inquiry, and they can start all over again. But if it's not been, I'm, I, I have a, my common sense view. Again, there's that term which we all hate. But if, if it's been kind of not challenged at the court of appeal level, if it's been if it's been ignored as a grounds at the appeal, that it was that the, that. That having that jacket in the trial was not creating an unfair trial, right? So I really, I really think that it's going to be really hard to get it excluded the second time. But you're right; it's, they go back, it goes, they go back to zero. They start over. Yeah. You know, with the the, the police, the way they bungle the thing. The well, well, well wait a minute, minute. Now the jury, the jury found the man guilty. So you're you're you're, you're reading the newspaper headlines, yeah. and. It, 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 there's evidence, what you find in court, there's evidence, and, and the jury, it's for the jury to decide what happened. The other interesting thing I heard, I'm going to get the gentleman here in a sec, uh, and any lawyers in the room, or future lawyers, you might be amused to hear this. this I love this one, when the, when the trial started, the, uh, the jury, the, the, the uh, Justice Walsh explained to the, uh, the jurors, nothing a lawyer says in court is a fact. 
And I thought, geez, that doesn't stop him talking all day. Sorry, that gentleman, was it yours? Did, did the police do any serious investigation on alternative suspects? There was only one, and I talk about it in the book a bit. They couldn't, it's, it's weird because, you know, one of, one of the things that came out in the, in, the, in the revelations is that Mr. Olin, was a, the victim was a very difficult man and had, a, you know, got in a lot of quarrels with people and things like that. But despite, you know, having that brutal personality, they, they couldn't come up with viable leads. The one person uh, that they looked at a little bit, and this would kind of fit the movie of the week, you know, plot line, he had a mistress, the husband of the mistress, would be top of the list, but the gentleman was 83 at the time. Uh, he was 87, and we don't know, we don't want to be ageist, but he was 87 when he testified in court. And uh, he, uh, uh, again, I would love to get into the evidence that, they, that the two sides had that was not presented in court. One of the things that came out, not in court, the jury never heard this, is that the mistress Diana Sedlicek took a lie detector test because I think the crown did not see her as a totally you know, stable witness sort of thing. And so she was interviewed twice, her husband was interviewed once, and it does come up uh, in some of the, pre the uh, maneuverings towards the very end when the two sides were uh, trying to uh, influence the judge in his instructions to the jury. A very frustrated defense said, well, you know, they sh it's an, adequate, an inadequate police investigation that did not probe Mr. Sedjilchek more deeply, right? Uh, and, and the judge said, well, you know, that's, that's the investigator's discretion. I'm going to give them that. I'm not going to put that in my charge. Uh, they admitted that it would be very difficult to get a warrant. There'd be very little, you know, probable cause. It'd be very difficult to get a warrant to go after Mr. Sedlicek's phone records and banking records. Because the whole idea, they, they, this, you know, this, sort of the background theory wasn't that this nice retired gentleman from Czechoslovakia who was gardening in his retirement was, uh, be, was killing someone, but he might have hired someone to do it, right? In theory, movie of the week. But uh, he, uh, he was ruled out as, 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 as a credible suspect, although, as you read in the book, and if you follow the media, they did, uh, Mr. Gould did grill him a bit when he was in court, asked him questions. He didn't, he didn't understand one when he said, did the police ever ask you, does your, does your car have a GPS unit, right? And the 87-year-old gentleman said, what? You know, and I think what he was suggesting there is that they could have got, you know, in the movie of the week, the investigators might have got his GPS and found out, you know, where he was driving on certain occasions, right? And again, uh, I don't know, has anyone ever been to Darling's Island, New Brunswick? Okay. How many hitmen do you think are hanging out in Darling's Island, New Brunswick? I don't want to, anyway, I, 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 uh, I, uh, anyway, I, I guess, sorry. We'd like to know more. Yeah, but, but it, is he, notwithstanding the age, I mean, yeah. it, oh, is yeah. the man robust and capable of handling the axe? Yeah, and, but he, you know, he and his wife were both alibi witnesses. They both were for each other that night. They were both home, right? And uh, he claimed not to know of the affair. Now, what's interesting in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, in the book, I point out there's a bit of a discrepancy that she's, they're both on, on the stand the same day. And uh, she said that her husband knew about the affair earlier, like after, still after the murder. He claimed he only found out about it months later when he came back from a trip to Europe, right? And his lawyer, they subsequently divorced. So again, there's a little interesting discrepancy there. But you're right, no, we don't want to be ageist. I'm sure there's been some extreme, some, some, some pretty b bad crimes carried out by elderly people, but again, he wasn't spotted uptown. He was, they, they were each other's alibi. She, we know she was home because there were, uh, you know, so much of the evidence from this trial is uh, electronic, right? We know from her text messages and stuff where she was with her phone, right? And uh, so, but he's the only one. And except for the, I talk about the, uh, the defense argument too about the back door and the other guy and that type of thing, but uh, there might be, I don't know if there's any legal scholars here, but you, know, you can't just say there's another guy. You have to come up with another guy, right? Uh, and often the other guy where you have a successful other guy did it defense is that you have a bunch of criminals who commit a crime and, what, and two of them are testifying for the crown, but they're dodgy characters. If you can kind of deflect some of the court's suspicion on these dodgy characters, they become the other guy, you know, you, you, but you need another guy, you know, who's like actually involved at that level, right? So, so but yeah, there's so many, it's interesting because the, uh, 
one of the daughters, when she, and I, I mentioned this a couple times in the book, when, when she was asked the question, could your did your father have any enemies? And she responded, he could have anyone for an enemy. Well, you know, that's, that's, that's very expansive, but, you know, and there's stories, I didn't put them in the book, people come up and tell you things you don't know are true, you know, that, you know, uh, yelling matches and fist fights and stuff with the gentleman over the years, right? But, uh, but there are no credible witnesses whose names came up. Now, whether there's anything in the police files that we didn't see, you know, uh, I, I don't know. Pardon me? How old was uh, she was several years younger. Uh, I could, uh, she was several years younger than Richard. She, she was maybe 60-ish when he was 69 when he was killed. And uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, it's interesting too. Uh, she's, uh, uh, you know, as I put in the book, she's from a blue collar background, right? And, uh, and, and so, um, and the reason they came back to New Brunswick in part because their son went to the, uh, private school, Rasse Collegiate School, which is like King's Edge Hill sort of deal. And then he retired there and she was from there, right? So, and they so, and it kind of like the soap opera version of reality, they socialized with the Olins, right? And she was in his interior decorator and they went to the same Catholic church, but he helped raise the money to build. And I talk about that funeral. It, it, it's very intriguing, you know, I found there was a pattern in New Brunswick, I don't know what happens in Nova Scotia, when wealthy people die, this will sound, sound totally cynical. Politicians go out of the way to tell how much the, peop the common people love them, right? So, so, you know, these things that are said at funerals, right? So, very interesting, uh, d uh, much of things happening at that funeral, which you can read about. Yes? Um, is there any onus on the police to do further investigations now, or can they only bring a new trial with everything that's already been gathered? I think they can start over, and, and maybe some of those little nuggets that the gentleman who, uh, the gentleman who didn't hear anything, right? right. He, 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 that was in the preliminary but not in the trial, right? Who knows what they, I mean, to me, I put some stuff in the book about Dennis's post-crime uh, post behavior that I'm, I'm sure the defense was glad the jury never saw about all those trips and they bought a boat and there's, you know, the property transactions and things like that for a guy who supposedly was broke and, you know, it's, it's not illegal but it's just the optics. Right. Uh, there's, you know, it, it, and again, according to the defense, the defense thinks that it was just a series of, bad, of unlucky coincidences, right, that come together to conspire to convince a jury. But if I was the defense, I wouldn't necessarily want a jury, you know, to, to see all this stuff in the movie of the week version. It could be compelling, but maybe in the Canadian court of law, it doesn't it, it doesn't matter as much? I, I don't know. On the drapes, I don't remember that one. He had several different spots, but he, you know, he was working there, and I don't know if he got paper cuts. I don't know what, you know, but he, he was the only uh, uh, identified, you know, male in the place uh, in terms of the DNA, uh, and he gave a voluntary sample, and you know, he was ruled out as a suspect. Now he he was he was, he was just a university age kid living with his parents, and he and his dad, uh, by the way, the, Mr. McFadden who's the father of the Galen, who refused to give a voluntary sample for DNA for whatever reason, maybe because his DNA was all, all over the old office, uh, he's now parking in the victim's parking spot and running his company. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so just, it's, it's weird, you know? So, so but uh, I, I don't know about the drapes, but uh, he was ruled out to be a suspect uh, because he was with his father that night. You know, they, they traveled together, they lived in Rosse, right? And uh, he was just there doing a summer job. There was a hand over here. Did yeah. you find that in your research and was it common knowledge? No. No. Not outside not outside the bubble. That was court that, that came out for the that came, if you watch Dennis's uh, uh, interrogation online, and by that time they'd already talked to the mother, Dennis's two sisters and his wife, and they were just pouring out to the officers about how difficult person Richard was, right? And so Dennis said so and that I think that that could be kind of the tunnel, the possible tunnel vision of the case. But that was not known in, in, in the, uh, the, the, the media and the, and, the, and the community is very protective of the elite, right? So you wouldn't know this stuff, right? And, and uh, so even like, it's interesting that, you know, when it first was revealed that uh, I put in the beginning of the book, I'm just thinking the average man who's 69 years old doesn't come home 
Just imagine if your father or grandfather was 69 years old and he doesn't come home one night. What would happen in most houses? Right? What would happen in most houses? Would someone make a phone call? Apparently it was no big deal, right? So, 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 but, but the, the, uh, but what's interesting, it's a former mayor of St. John in a protective media statement. Oh, he's a workaholic. He would have worked there all night, right? Which is complete BS, right? So, so uh, anyway, so that's just one little example of, of how there's a protective cone, right, uh, over, over things. And even, it's interesting, uh, we're still on camera too, I better not say the next one then. Uh, so I'm just hearing things in the community that a lot of people in Rosse are really on edge about things, right? And, uh, but no, I mean, it sounds like it was a very stressful situation for the family to have. And Dennis, to be fair, in his interview with the police, he says that, you know, my father, uh, it, you know, if he was a younger person, he might have been diagnosed with something, like a personality disorder or something. He had one of those, you know, one of those charismatic, very hard-driven guys who, was, who could be very fun to be with when you're riding on snowmobiles and down, you know, he's the guy who wants to go the fastest downhill skiing. He's 69 years old and he will be the biggest daredevil and he'll do all this stuff, but a really hard guy to deal with. I mean, one of the things that came out in court is that he, uh, he made his wife of 40 years. Uh, he, he, you know, he paid some of the bills, but basically she had any, anything she had to get through the house. This guy's worth $35 million now. So anything he needed to, she needed to get through the house, she had to pay for it out of her own money give him the receipts, and then he would enter, you know, enter this into his Quicken program, and then he'd cut her a check. So maybe that's why he has $35 million. But you know, the, imagine living, you know, it's a pressure, very high pressure uh, situation, right? So it's you know, a dysfunctional family. And I, and I, think most, I think the dysfunction was from what, you know, it's just things we gleaned through court testimony, right? We don't know all the ins and outs of it. I think one of the things that damages uh, Mr. Olin's testimony, going back to the reason why he was convicted, is that his first uh, statements to the police, it's, he stresses a very negative father-son relationship, and then when he's in court, it's more positive. The father is described as an eccentric, interesting mentor, as opposed to a hard guy to deal with, right? So the jury, probably saw those two different stories and think, thought, what's going on here, right? Yeah? Excuse me. Sorry, we're over time. Okay. So if we could please wrap it up. Okay, just one quick question then. Okay, I just, uh, I, find it, I found it strange the whole time how the, the jacket was pinned on as the most important piece of evidence, but like you say, he was said to have been like pleasure that about 49, so if I had knocked you over there for an or something like that, 49, I think there'd be a lot more buzz by it than like three little yeah, I mean, and that's one of those issues I talked about the last chapter. And, and, and the, the RCMP blood expert did testify that it's not always the case that the blood is going to come back at you with the type of weapon. It might go out to the sides. But certainly, you would think there'd be more blood out there, right? But there's ways of dealing with blood, maybe. And again, that's all speculative. But you can maybe look at that last chapter of the book where I tried to, uh, to uh, go back and forth on that issue. Anyway, I want to... Uh, Thank you, everyone, for coming. Sorry for going a bit beyond our hour and a half. And uh, good luck with the election, by the way. And uh, thanks again. <laughs>